bar is open and will be open, and Keith is not the kind of person that worries about people needing to go and get a beer in the middle of a talk. <laughs> so he's already said that's okay. Um, so we have lots of Jack and the Green people here today, and a couple of weeks ago, some of you may have been, I don't know where he's gone, there he is, Barry, who gave a wonderful talk about maples, and we had the May Queen um, dancing, uh, maple dancing in the room a couple of weeks ago, and of course that's next uh, weekend. But for now, it is with huge pride that I am introducing somebody who is very close to my heart, <laughs> who is going to talk about a subject which is very close to all our hearts. So please, for the founder of Hastings Traditional Jack in the Green, Mr. Keith Leach. Okay, let's all go with the bulb. <laughs> <coughs> I've already noticed that I thought I'd gone through all of these and already I've got this one wrong, but never mind. <laughs> it, it's an introduction that could go on for many hours if you're not careful. Um, who would have thought that 40 years ago, if I'm standing in front of it, please tell me, uh, who would have thought that 40 years ago what hatched as a, a kind of crazy idea when I first moved into Hastings would turn into what we've got today. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to, I want to go through what Jack's in the Green are related customs, the Hastings Jack, what the influences were and are on it, a little bit of how it's evolved to what it is today, and a little bit of looking to the future to see what may, because we don't know, happen. Uh, so I suppose we start off with the idea, uh, asking that question as, as, as to why we're decorating with leaves and flowers in the spring anyway. Uh, and we've got a couple of pictures, pictures here. This is uh, Bampton in Oxfordshire where they go out with May garlands uh, actually towards the end of the month. But I'll talk about why May the 1st isn't necessarily the be all and end all. And this is Lewis Garland Day. Uh, so there are a couple of examples there. But why do we go out and decorate? Well, think about it. How's it been this winter? <laughs> Have we enjoyed it? Uh, unless you're a duck. Uh, I certainly haven't. And it's cost me a fortune in heating. And to finally start seeing the vestiges of spring and flowers and leaves. And, okay, I'm not a farmer. But if I were a farmer to actually see the crops beginning to grow, I think I'd be very happy. And if I were an Anglo-Saxon living in a hut somewhere outside Hastings, which they would have been, I think I would have been extremely happy because they were all basically farmers. And uh, I think that's a good enough reason. I don't think it's anything to do with anything other than the seasons that people are at last. And who can blame them, to be honest? That's why. Would you like me to advance your slides for I'm fine. Unless you want to, step on there. I, Could you just say slide? Yeah. I'll do it. Thank you. That's really nice. <laughs> I, I, I do have a, a thingy, but for some reason I can't get it to work. Uh, but, uh, you've got a new uh, thingy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of our lives, and the thingy that I've got. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's full of them. Uh, so. One of the theories, for want of a better word, about this is that people have cottoned on to this idea of something called Beltane. Beltane being the sort of Celtic New Year, which was about now. To be honest, I feel that this whole idea of it being a vestige of Beltane is the figment of somebody's imagination. 
Uh, I don't think it... Uh, I mean, Belt Aim was simply a celebration at this time, as I said, because who wouldn't want to celebrate? I don't think it's anything more special. And, and, and this, this is something completely contemporary. You can tell it's contemporary, uh, simply by what, how they're dressed, or should I say undressed, uh, and, and the torches and so on. And I've seen this photograph taken from 200 yards away, and they're actually standing behind some barriers, surrounded by people taking photographs. Uh, it's basically a stage performance. So, you know, so it's nothing, is it, really? Just looks good. Okay. Thank you. So I actually subscribe to the idea that May Day goes back to something called the May Games. The May Games happened at this time of year. Uh, they could be any time in May. They could be from the beginning of May, actually until the middle of June. And they went on for about a week. <clears throat> and they happened right the way through the medieval period. Uh, certainly post-1066, the May Danes were a very, very common thing indeed. And the May Games were an opportunity at this time of year. The seeds are in the ground. They're beginning to grow. You've actually got a tiny little bit of slack time before you've got to start getting out there and really getting on with the work again. So it's a good opportunity, while the seeds are growing, to just get out there and have a little bit of a party. And the May Games were in each town or village, and they were run by this lot. And they are the equivalent of what we now call a church fete. It said they went on for a week. <laughs> and it was the main means by which the village and the parish, because at that time the whole idea of the council and the parish being separate, and I mean they were all together, you know. So the money for the village came through the parish, came through the church, came. It, it was the governing body of, 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 of the town and village. And it was a way of making money to keep the town or village going through the rest of the year. To pay for all those things that need paying for. And here we have the May Games, and there's lots of things on here. There's people dancing in a circle. Uh, there's some people boxing. There's a bloke drinking too much and throwing up. <laughs> uh, there's some Morris dancers over here. There's a maypole. You've got, there's some more people dancing. You, you've got, there's the pub. So you've got, oh, there's the Morris dancers over the back there. So you, you've got the vestiges of all the things that you would consider to be part of May. And these were the May games. And so they continued right the way through until the Reformation. And at the Reformation, during the long Parliament, Cromwell and his cronies decided that people going out and having a good time was really not what they wanted people to do. Uh, it was considered to be wrong and certainly shouldn't be run by the church because the church was therefore um, promoting licentiousness, drinking, dancing, singing, and all the other bad things that might go on with that. And therefore, there was one particular person called William Prynne, who, if I can remember quite the quotation, it was something like, and then the, they dance on ye church like devils, and do terribly bad things. And so it was stopped, along with Christmas and absolutely everything else that meant people going out and enjoying themselves except bonfire night but because bonfire night was anti-Catholic therefore considered to be good uh, therefore was not touched by <coughs> well uh, and that's why it's so big 
But that's a that's another talk altogether. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there are a number of things associated with the May Games, and there are a number of associate things associated with this sort of May Day through <coughs> to the middle of June thing. Uh, certainly there were garlands. Uh, garlands become important because Jack in the Green is actually a special kind of garland. Garlands go back a long way. And here is an example of a garland that I took a photograph of in Banton, I think. Uh, a very typical stick garland. Just a stick, ribbons, flowers, blossom, leaves, and a doll. So the doll represents the Virgin Mary. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, other things around May Day were May Poles. Uh, I showed you the Maypole in the May Games uh, in, in the previous slides. I've got a Maypole here. This is a typical English Maypole with people dancing around it, having a good time. Uh, this guy's having a really good time. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what they were. And people used to have an exceptionally good time. In London, time of Henry VIII, I think it was, or was it? No, I think it was Henry VIII. I've got my date possibly wrong. Somebody will tell me in a minute, I'm sure. Um, there was a maypole in the city of London at uh, Leadenhall. And the people dancing around it and drinking around it got so drunk and had such a good time that the authorities came and chopped it down. <laughs> that uh, was the uh, replica of that maypole now hangs on the side of the pub by St Andrew's undershaft uh, in Leadenhall. St Andrew's undershaft got its name because the shaft of the maypole was higher than the spire of the church. In Hastings we decided as part of Jack and the Green to have a maypole in George Street. And I can't remember really how years ago it was now, but I, 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 I'd finished Jack in the Green, I was at home, I was having a sleep, and the phone rang telling me I had to get down to George Street immediately. And I got down there to find a drunken mob dancing around the maypole, <laughs> climbing it, throwing bottles at each other, and then someone decided that climbing the maypole was a bit tame, they'd climb it gutter in opposite and the guttering fell off the side of the building and they fell into George Street and the ambulance uh, and etc 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 so exactly the same thing that was going on in Lem Hall about 400 years previously and you know what the authorities did? They made me take it down! So 400 years later nothing had changed uh, so that's why I haven't got a maypole in Hastings anymore. Where was it? In George Street, in the in, Butler's Gap. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw it on yeah. that day. Yeah. The, yeah it, was, it was quite fun watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hole where the Christmas tree goes was originally built for the maypole. Uh, so the Victorians decided that this really wasn't a good idea. And, and therefore, they brought in from, now, Barry and I were talking about this the other day, I, I believe it's from Germany, Barry believes it's from Italy, does it really matter? But they brought in this. So instead of having a load of adults getting drunk and made a maypole and having a good time and climbing it and falling over and hurting themselves, they brought in something for children who could dance around a maypole and weave pretty patterns and not get drunk. And so... That's why we now have this kind of maypole. There's nothing wrong with it, it's, but that's how it evolved. That's where it came from. <coughs> Thanks. Maypole still exists. That's the one at Burry in Elmet, which is in Yorkshire. It's just, just near Tadcaster. I've been up there so many times and I've never been to look at it, so that's on the list. And uh, it's the tallest maypole in England. 
they do re-erect it every couple of years and I really all got there and see it sometime. In fact, I think Barry, we all had a trip booked in to do it together, don't you think? Yeah. Have a good time and go and see Some that. Some disagreement about the height. Yeah, and they, and then they climb it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. On YouTube. <laughs> Look at YouTube. Uh, there are other made customs. Uh, in the western part of the country, in Devon and Cornwall, they have the dancing hobby horses. Uh, this is Padstow, where I have not yet managed to go because it always clashes with Jack in the Green. Well, I've worked out in the next two years I should be able to. Uh, it's begun on a very long time. It's a very closed community. Uh, they don't like people coming to watch because they consider they're in the way that... But fortunately, I... I know a couple of the Padstow guys, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get him. But even then, I can't be certain. Uh, but that's that's Padstow, which is one of the hobby horse traditions, definitely happening on May Day. Thank you. Uh, this is the hunting of the Earl of Rome, which is uh, another hobby horse tradition. I haven't shown you the picture of the horse. I've shown you the picture of the Earl of Rome. Uh, this happens in Coon Martin on the north coast of Devon. Uh, it's actually a revival, uh, so, so they're a little bit more open, uh, and uh, I think Heather and I have been along for the last four or five years, and uh, we've built up a nice relationship with the, with the village, and a few of them are coming to Jack of the Green on Monday, in fact a couple of them might even be here already, they're not bringing their hobby horse, they're not bringing, but they will be here. So that's really nice. So we've got that lovely link with the West Country traditions. So who's that character? That character is the Earl of Rome. The Earl of Rome uh, was apparently some kind of fugitive who uh, was hiding in the woods in Exmoor. And uh, they were looking for him and the Grenadiers went out and discovered him hiding in the woods and, and actually they, they reenact that. You know, this person goes and hides in the woods and they have to find him. <laughs> and uh, and, and once, once they found him, uh, and he's got these biscuits around his neck, because that's what he was eating. And he's stuck on the back of a donkey facing backwards, raided through the village, and every so often they shoot him. And he falls off the donkey, and the horse comes along and kind of dances over him. And he jumps up again, and sits on the back of the horse, and off they go again. Uh, and it's great. Uh, and we, we stop at every pub in Coombe Martin. And, and until we get to the sea about 12 hours later. And then uh, the horse comes along and he can't revive him. He's on the beach and he can't be revived. And so they pick him up. And they, they run down, the whole village, right? it's amazing, the whole village just runs down to the sea as they chuck him into the sea. And they, they've actually changed it for a dummy. Uh, but they, so some poor fisherman or trawler going up the Bristol Channel, what on earth is <laughs> Body floating pot. It's great. And it's at the end of May. It's a late May bank holiday. If you want to go and see something interestingly different, go to the little road in Coombe Martin. And... and, and Say hello to them when they're in Hastings, because they're coming down. They'll be coming down later on tonight. Was they in costume? Yeah, but you, you, you probably won't think, because just, they're just sort of wearing Victorian type stuff, but they'll be here. Another example of a, a May Garland is the one in Castleton in Derbyshire. This one's great fun. Uh, another one goes on all day. Um, it's, a, it's a bloke on horseback, and... Uh, they pop the garland on, on top of him. Uh, he's got a woman with him, the, the, the lady of the May. The lady of the May used to be a man, but it's now a woman. And they go all around Castleton. They beat the bounds with it, basically. All day long, going from pub to pub. Uh, there's a maypole. There's kids doing maypole dancing. They've got their own dance. They've got a brass band. And then at the end of the day, the horse goes into the churchyard. A hook comes down from the tower of the churchyard hooks onto the garland, and you next you know, whoop, it goes straight up the tower, and it sits on top of the, uh, one of the spires on top of the tower, until it falls off. <laughs> there you 
go. That's comforting. Mm -hmm. And that's another one. And that's on the 29th of May. It's on OCAP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's the sort of resume I have some of the main customs that are around for associated with Jack and Uncle. And now, now let's move ourselves into, into London. <coughs> uh, London started to grow in the 18th century, really. 18th, 19th century, as people came out of the villages into the towns. You've got the Industrial Revolution, you've got people going into the towns up north, into the mills and all the rest of it. And you've also got people coming down into London to make their fortune as we're moving from an agricultural society into a more industrial society. Uh, I've been looking back through my own family history and all that, and uh, yeah, I'm a DFL by the way. And, uh, and I noticed that uh, most of my London family moved into London probably in the early and mid 19th century. And before that, they'd come from various rural villages around London. Uh, oddly enough, a load of them, and I had no idea at the time, from this place called East Sussex. <laughs> Just come back where I came from. <laughs> uh, anyway, the milkmaids went around London on the 1st of May and uh, they would dress up uh, in finery, carry silver with them. They carry a lot of silverware and uh, they'd bang drums, play music and apparently the music was dreadful. <laughs> uh, which is why the bloke's got his fingers in his ears. So these are the milkmaid dogs going around London, thanks. And, and here's a, a, an engraving of the one of the milkmaid's gardens going around London. Uh, engraving of the structure covered in leaves and silverware. And uh, going out on May Day having a good time. This custom was revived by New Esperance Morris. And this is the Islington Garland going around Islington to, uh, as a revival of the Milkmaid's Gardens. <coughs> Thank you. So you've got all these guilds in London and they are all out on May Day and they're all out to have a good time. And they're all building these gardens and they're all trying to get better than each other in what they're going to do. So you get the gardens are getting fancier and bigger and um, all the rest of it. And the chimney sweeps <clears throat> made a garland that was so big that the only way you could move it was to get inside it. <laughs> And that was a Jack in the Green. And the first reference to a Jack in the Green is from London and it is in the very late 18th century in South London. For some reason I've got it in my head, it's Crystal Palace, but somebody quizzed me on that and I can't find the reference. But I'm pretty sure it's South London, probably called Gypsy Hill then. Yeah, it could be. Uh, but that's when it's first seen. Uh, it's the first time somebody bothered to write anything. And, and always with these things, something could have been going on forever, but no one's bothered to write about it. But the first reference is certainly late 18th century South London. Um, lots of engravings. Uh, and it grew from there and in the late 18th, early to mid 19th century became very big and very popular in London. Thank you. So here we have a, an early Jack in the Green in London. These characters are very typical. <coughs> Somebody playing music, usually badly, the Jack in the Green, the Lord and Lady of the May. Almost certainly the chimney sweep and his wife. 
uh, who would uh, be covered in soot, uh, partly because it's their trade, and partly because it probably hadn't been properly washed off. If you're sweeping chimneys every day in the 19th century, you're just going to be dirty no matter how. People didn't always bark, you know. And there they are. Thank you. Uh, so, I, I'm not quite sure it's London. <laughs> to me, it looks like Piccadilly Circus, Regent Street, not sure. Uh, <coughs> but this is a Jack of the Green in London. And the important thing up there is the words. You know, you don't go around thinking this is a sweet countryside, lovely, rural idyll. It's an urban custom. It's from London. We've got the characters here. Somebody playing music badly. Someone banging a drum badly. <laughs> Lord and Lady of the May. Clowns. And various other characters. Thank you. Um, it started moving out. I, I, I like this picture, uh, simply because it, it's, it's different. But this is St Mary's Cray. St Mary's Cray is kind of somewhere between Seven Oaks and Dartford, isn't All it? Not? Too. Uh, up there, right? yeah. <laughs> and uh, they had a, a Jack in the Greedy procession. Uh, and you're beginning to see a Victorian influence here, because the Victorians were obsessed with Merry England. There were a number of times through history where there's an obsession with Merry England. And at those points, people make things up. Uh, the first obsession, well, there's probably one before it, but the first one that I know of was the Tudors. They had an obsession with Merry England, and they made up a lot of what they used to be. And then the Victorians made up a lot. So we've got a lot of made-up stuff here. But at the same time, it's kind of based on what was. We've got Jack in the Green, clowns. We've got people dressed up as animals, we've got May Queens, we've got mock bishops and royalty. Very 19th century, you think about bonfires with mock bishops and royalty. I mean, it's all, it's all kind of there. So there's, there's a very much Victorian imagination. Um, Probably the last surviving Jack in the Green that actually ran on to the early 20th century is the Deptford Jack in the Green. Uh, this is Fowler's troop in Deptford in the early 19th century, just before the First World War. And uh, they went out on May the 1st, and uh, if it wasn't for the First World War, they might still have been doing so. Deptford were revived. Deptford were revived before Hastings, uh, and uh, Hastings Jack and the Green and Deptford Jack and the Green are great friends with each other. In the early years of Hastings Jack and the Green, Deptford came down to help us. Uh, Deptford is always on May the 1st, Hastings is always on the May Day back. So unfortunately, on Monday, we're both doing our own. Uh, which is a real shame, because there are a number of Jacks in the Green that we're friends with. And it would have been lovely if we could have all been out together, but being May the 1st, we can't. Uh, but they were invited, and they said, thank you, we're doing our own. I said, yes, I know, but I thought I'd invite you anyway. Uh, but next year, they'll come down to us, we'll go up to them, and we help each other out. It's a very different beast to host in Jack in the Green, but it's much smaller. It's probably more like what it used to be. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the first revived Jack in the Green was actually in Oxford. And I think it was the Oxford City Morris men took it out because there was the carol singing on May morning from the tower of Magdalen College. Uh, and the Oxford City Morris men went there to dance and then they thought they'd bring a Jack of Green with them. So that's sort of the first revival, probably 1950s or thereabouts. I jump across a bit because 
I want to talk about influences because I'm moving into Hastings. We didn't quite know where to put this slide, but I decided to put it here. Uh, uh, the, the Hastings Jack is influenced by the experiences of the people who put it together and influenced by my own experiences. And in trying to work out what to do, I've been to Deptford, I knew about Deptford. Um, we knew what had happened in Hastings because, as it turns out, we have the, probably the best record of what happened in the 19th century of any town in England simply because the, a particular journalist liked it and wrote a lot about it. So we're very lucky there. But at the same time, we, didn't, we needed to work out what to do to make it contemporary, but at the same time we needed to work out what to do to make it rooted in the past. I couldn't get a time machine and go back to 1840 Hastings. <laughs> what I could do, what we could do, was go across to Europe where they have four or five, six hundred year old customs that are still continuing. Uh, and this is La Ducasta App, which is just south of Brussels. And they have probably the oldest giant festival in Europe that's still going, and it's been going on for about 600 years. Uh, so if I want to look at something old, that's a good place to go. And a lot of us went. Uh, we were taken, there's a man called Dave Lobb who's very important in all this. And a lot of us were taken over by Dave to, to this to, uh, to have a look and breathe it in, really. And uh, it's worth going. It's on the fourth weekend in August which is usually the bank holiday, but not always, <clears throat> uh, on the Saturday and the Sunday. And it's huge. It's a uh, UNESCO-listed custom. Let's not go there. The only country in Europe that refuses to list its customs with UNESCO is the United Kingdom. And it's no point making it party political because they've tried all parties and they've all said there's no need to because we're already very well protected. Mm. Box they are. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so, yeah. UNESCO listing of customs is required in this country big time before we lose them. However, These are minor characters there now. The, the, the giants behind them are the major characters. But here we've got a couple of minor characters sitting in the foreground that, that are just wandering around. We've got the Diablo, the devil, who's kind of four with balloons. And standing next to him, we've got an Onda Fui, who is a green man. Their green man suits are made from ivy leaves with Vaseline. They take two weeks to make. And uh, they then wander around and do nothing in particular, <laughs> except look vaguely interesting. They, they don't even interact, so they, they become really minor characters, but they look amazing. And the arms of Foy are what the British, because it's not only Hastings, what the British green men are, are based on through the work of Dave Law. Okay. Thank you. So, start researching Hastings. What happened? I, I was living in London and I started I started my journey actually in in Wales, where I ended up going to uni. Uh, long story, doesn't matter, I ended up going to uni in Wales. Uh, and uh, ostensibly to study biology. In, in fact, 
while I was there, I discovered horse dancing in Wales, of all places. I discovered folk music, English folk music, English custom in Wales, of all places. And because I was living with a guy in my uni flat who is still the Plaid Cymru candidate for Clonethley and still not managed to get in, <laughs> I also discovered pride uh, in your own culture. I won't call it nationalism, I'll call it pride in your own culture. Well, nationalism's bad, and pride in your own culture is good, if that makes sense. Um, and so I became obsessed with this. And when I went, got, got back to London, so I went back to London to, to teach, with some crazy idea that I could go to, go to the East End where I came from and bring all these kids up. And it's another story. It didn't work. Um, while I was there, I fell in with a lovely bunch of people, various Morris sites, who were equally interested in maintaining English culture, music, dance, song, customs, and all the rest of it. But more, more so, also interested in bringing back things that had died, that were no longer properly happening, such as the dancing giants, such as Jackson Green, and things of that nature. And, and the driving force behind that is Dave Long. Dave came down to the original Hastings, Jackson the Green, to help us. Uh, he was invited to come this year, but he said, uh, I'd love to come, but honestly, at the age of 86, I really think that perhaps well, I might give you a phone call. <laughs> Gordon over there was there. <laughs> and uh, this group called the Grand Order of Geezers was started by him, and they did so much. They were really, really important in, in, in the maintenance of custom within this country. And probably the, the nicest story was that Dave originally set them up because he's a Cornishman. And there's a thing in St. Ives called the Throne of the Silver Book. And he'd heard it wasn't going to happen anymore. So he got a bunch of his mates to go down to Cornwall to do it. The locals were so upset that a bunch of beer bells had come down to do it for them that from that point on, custom survives. And that's important. And so, uh, and from that point on, yeah, it, it, it started to roll. And it was mainly just getting those old London customs going. And then I moved. I came and I had this East End lad obsession that ever since I was born, that I was going to leave the East End because it was a shithole. And I was, I, was, I, was, I was going to move to the seaside. And I didn't care which seaside. And I ended up here. And uh, I've now got the bit in my teeth about customs. And I also learned how to do folk research. So I dived into the library. And almost the first thing I found was this photograph. Plus this huge amount of information. And it, it dawned on me what needed to be done. Um, this is, as was the St. Leonard's Jack in the Green, and the photograph, you probably recognise it, it's the, it's around the back of the Masonic Hall. Uh, and you've got the characters there, you've got the Jack in the Green, you've got the man that plays the drum badly, <laughs> you've got his wife. But rather unusually, we don't have a lord and lady, we've got a clown. But we've got these people in these kind of raggy coats, which you don't find in the London pictures. 
Uh, it's a black and white picture, so we have no idea they might have been bits of newspaper. They might have been cloth, they might have been leaves. We can't tell. It's too... But they're there. And they've got darkened faces. Almost certainly soot. But even way back in 1983, we can't, we kind of thought that maybe using soot might be a little bit kind of more dodgy these days. And uh, face paint had become a thing. It existed. Uh, and therefore green paint became the order of the day. But I doubt they were wearing green paint then because it didn't happen. It wasn't there. Thank you. <clears throat> So, in 1983, we did it again. Uh, almost, uh, approximately exactly 100, 100 years after the first photograph and after the Jack in the Green had stopped. Uh, we all look considerably younger. Uh, which one's you? Yeah, which one's you? Yeah. <laughs> and there are Heaven, that's Marshall. There are one, that's Nick, two, three, four, five. Anyway, basically there's one, two, three. Three of those people, I think it's just three, are still doing it. I'm one of them. But that was it. Not a procession of thousands. That was it. And we started on the West Hill, and we started at the dawn, and we didn't think there was anybody to dance with the dawn, so we went to the fire station because we knew they'd be open. <laughs> and we, had, we all had to go on the pole. And, uh, uh, yeah. Well, this, by the way, is Mick the Pole, who uh, was there from the beginning. He was one of the original Deptford, London people that comes out to help us. Oh, yeah. And. Uh, this was the Jack in the Green. Soon after this, we went to Mr. Cherry's and it fell apart. <laughs> uh, and yeah, but we did it. And it was just, there was nobody watching. There's a load of people standing around going, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, When we did them in, in London, it was the same. But this, uh, this has turned up when, uh, when Lorna did her, what, uh, What have you got by way of history of the last 40 years? Uh, I, point, I, I got it from Andy, I don't know where you got it from. Uh, Dave Rock, actually. From Dave Rock. Dave Rock, yeah. Yeah. Somebody had actually hung on to my original instructions. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 we've been looking at them, wondering how much of this is prophecy. I said, we start at St. Clement's Caves at dawn, about 5.15, to dance from the caves at... Uh, 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 and we're going to end up with Mr. Cherries. Um, where do you want to go? Uh, I think we might need some green men. Have we got any volunteers? <laughs> now people are just busting the gut to do it. Uh, it's very important that Jack in the Green keeps on dancing, no matter what. Uh, Remember, we will be with the public and other Morris sides when we try not to be offensive. <laughs> <laughs> For example, yeah. the polls. Def definitely <coughs> prophecy. Uh, extent of commitment. It'll be nice to have you there all day. I know what you're like, and after you, but if you come along for some of it, that'd be good. <laughs> uh, and, and, and rather interestingly, because we've been having a discussion about it lately. Uh, <coughs> Even then, I said, and I think we all have a trolley with beer on it. 
So that's forced. Time, shall we have a cake bearer? Yeah, shall we have a cake bearer? We, did, we never did have a cake bearer. <laughs> if anybody wants to bring cake, we'll, we'll, we'll have it. <laughs> um, so, Jackson the Green in Hastings, this book, so it was there in the 19th century. It was revived in 1983, but in between, there were other revivals in the area. And it happened with the May Queen in Hollington in the 40s and 50s. So here is the Hollington Jack in the Green as was, which, which sits in the middle there, thank you. Um, and here we have the Hollington May Queen. Thank you. And this is interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to, have, to, I'm going to have to fiddle with this. Are you saying then the Hollington May Queen is the same as Jack in the Greens and a bit different? It's a bit different, but it was, yeah, sure. it was, it, it was a Jack in the Green that was, was placed on it. Careful with the place. And uh, remember, this is 1983. <laughs> they kept very quiet about it. And I didn't know about it particularly until relatively recently and the recording has re turned up from Rye in 1982. And way before I came down there was a schism in the local Morrisons. I don't know why, and I don't want to know why, but the ancient history, and there's no schisms anymore, but there was. And one of these schisms went off to Rhine. I won't play all of it for you, but I'm going to give it to Owen to put on the website, because it's ten minutes long. However, we'll play some of it. If I'm getting to work. to Paul Dengate, who had a copy of this and would let us have it. And we'll, I'm going to give it to Owen to put on the website, because that's a huge, significant part of the history, that two years before we revived it, it had already been revived by the other lot. <laughs> but they didn't keep it going, so they don't count. <laughs> So, but that's, that's, that's really, and, and I'm really pleased that I can finally acknowledge that. So, 
So, Jack, as we know, is now back in Hastings. Uh, and uh, here's, here's more of what we kind of know today. Uh, There's the influence of the reading of the old newspapers. And then, why is it in the old town? Why is it not in St. Leonard's where it started? Um, I kind of thought about it and thought, what would the old, you know, if it had carried on, what would have happened? And I thought the old guys would have moved it where the money was. Uh, and at that time, 40 years ago, St. Leonard's was not the up and, up and plumbing place it is now. It was very run down. And I, I, I think they would have moved to where the money was in the old town. They would have followed the tourism. So that's part of why it's there. The, the bogeys, I'll come on to them later, but they are very much based on the figures of the Duchess du Caster at plus the ideas of Dave Lobb about the wild men of Europe. The whole feel of it, I fully confess, is a large amount of street theatre out of my own head. <laughs> so it happens in the old town. The Morris. Um, it wasn't originally the Morris. <clears throat> it was the chimney sweepers. The reason it's the Morris is because I was a Morris dancer. I still am a Morris dancer. And I went to the team and said, let's do this thing. And they said, what a good idea. Uh, that was Mad Jacks, who are still primary organisers along with Hannah's Cat, the other local team. Although the whole thing has become so big that it's now organised by an organising committee. It's a registered charity. It's got 12 trustees. Uh, and although the Morris is involved, it's act there are also a huge number of other people from the community who are now involved in that. And it's a year-round job. And it is, as you probably know, massively huge. Right. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've written an article on this. Uh, if you go into, I think it's Folk Edition magazine, you can read it. <clears throat> Drummers. Everybody, th th these are actually Samba Lanco, who are actually based on uh, Brazilian Samba bands. Uh, but the the drummers that are around are actually relatively recent. <clears throat> this is again a whole new talk in its own, so I'll just be very quick. <clears throat> but this, uh, this group in London again, the fourth group, um, were invited down to Battle Bonfire with one of the giants and decided that just playing folk music wasn't going to work with the noise of the bonfire and therefore worked out that banging drums, and they'd seen a load of drum work in Brayman, to have been over to Brayman Carnival, would, would work better. And they did 
didn't know how to work it out, but they were folk musicians, and so they based the rhythms on nursery rhymes. For example, Yeah? From that has sprung out this whole drumming tradition in Sussex that people think is terribly old. And I can trace it back to 1972. <laughs> <laughs> right. The Giants, these are also really straight from the mind of Dave Lobb, who revived the Giants in England. Um, and, and, and fantastically, the drumming was his idea. The Giants were his idea, and people have copied it, which is great. Jackson and Green was his idea. And people, it's fantastic, Green. Yeah. What's the time? I'm going on too much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Chimney Sweeps were the original uh, people that looked after Jack and the Green. And many years back now, I had a telephone call from Barry, who was sitting over the back there. And he said, You know this Jack and the Green you do? I said, Yeah, Barry. He said, uh, they're originally brought out by the sweeps. I said, yeah, no. <laughs> he said, I have a sweep. And I said, you going to come? He said, yes, please. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the milkmaids, uh, based on the, the milkmaids that predated Jack in the Green, uh, they originally appeared because all the blokes carrying the jack and the green were blokes and their wives and girlfriends wanted to do something and, and so they, they sort of came along with the, the idea of the milkmaids uh, that's Heather over there who's one of the first to sort of come up with this he is my son who now carries jack and the green <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, so there's the milkmaids dancing a couple of years ago, which is lovely. Uh, the jack itself, well, we can't. Rhododendrons. The reason we use rhododendrons is once again Dave Locke's idea. Uh, rhododendrons are, if you don't know, a weed. They're a bit like not weed. They're not really wanted. They choke everything around them. They're not very good. And you can slaughter them and not worry about ecology. <laughs> because they shouldn't be there anyway, and they're going to regrow like Billy Earth. They're an import from Australia, but they happen to have some good qualities. They cover very well, and because they have a waxy cuticle, they can last two or three days. So the reason you use rhododendron is, is just that. Thank you. Uh, the face. Jack and the Green didn't originally have a face. Uh, but we decided we wanted the Hastings one to have a face. And it's had a number of faces over the years. Dave Locke made a face, which was a lovely face, um, which we've still got somewhere. And then this is the, the modern face, made by Marty Dean, who is one of the bogeys. And it's actually a composite of all the faces of the guys that have carried Jack in the Green. I think it's got my nose, I'm told. <laughs> uh, so the bogeys. Yeah, this is, this is quite interesting in itself. So in that original year, the Jack and the Green was carried by Morris dancers. And even then I was talking, let's have green men. And we, we'd come out and all our Morris, white Morris kit was covered in dog shit and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so it was just a complete mess. And it also became completely obvious that there's someone climbing in and out. So we said, let's, let's kind of camouflage ourselves. So that's what we did. And uh, created this group. And they, they, they were originally all Morris dancers. Why are they called bogeys? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then one of them said, I think we need a name. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. What should we call ourselves? And he said, Let's call ourselves bogeys because we green and get out of people's noses. <laughs> it comes to bad joke and it's stuck. Um, it gets even better than that. A new journalist on the Hastings Observer called Andy Hemsley <laughs> phoned me up and said, oh, what are the green bloods called? They said, oh, they're called bogeys. 
And he went away, being a new young journalist and excited, and looked the word up <coughs> and discovered that bogey was also short for bogger, which means a spirit of the woods. Oh. There you go. Uh, since then, they've, they've become an entity in their own. Some of them are Morris dancers, some of them are not. Some of them are ex-Morris dancers. Uh, most of them have had some in their life. Sort of the criteria to be it is to have carried the jack in the green. Some of them were chosen because of their musical abilities on the drum. So a few of them are actually, but most of them um, were chosen because they could dance the jack in the green. We've all got a little bit old in the tooth. And I remember probably about 15 years ago now, I was in High Street, I'd carried it. I didn't think I'd done a very good job. I got out, I lay on the floor, my heart was racing, I couldn't breathe. And eventually I got up and I said to the guys, that's it, I've retired. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then we all got to that point and since then we have a whole new crew of young blokes that carry. And just coincidentally, it wasn't deliberate, it wasn't pushed, it didn't happen that way. But in a way it's quite nice. They're our sons. Aww. Which is, you know, and daughters. And sons-in-law and daughters-in-law. <laughs> so we, we appear to have developed something of a dynasty. Um, we originally used to take it up, well, in the first year we took it to the West Hill, we would just did something weird outside the West Hill Caf. <laughs> uh, after that we went into the castle, but we outgrew the castle. So we had to move on to the West Hill because it becomes so popular. The trouble with the West Hill is it doesn't have the atmosphere of the castle and it has a number of disadvantages. In particular, there's nothing there except grass. Therefore, everything that we need has to be brought in. That's water, power, toilets. And one of the biggest problems is that you lot way too much. <laughs> We had to empty those toilets three times last year, and that cost a fortune. But I'll come on to that later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the slaying of the jack, this, in the first year it was kind of, okay, we've had a good time, we've done this, uh, what should we do now? Oh, I don't know, I suppose we have to take it back to Keith's house and go down the pub. Um, uh, we will do something. Uh, oh, in the old days, I think they used to kill it. Oh, how should we kill it? Well, we could throw it in the sea. That's a good idea. That'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? Well, we, could, oh, but we could do this, we could do that. We didn't quite know what to do. So we kind of stuck, stuck a sword through it and it fell over and we thought, that didn't work, did it? That wasn't very nice. Oh, we, we, we buttered that up. We'll have to think of something else. Um, and... So we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll Morris dance around it and uh, lift it up, throw it in the air and drop it down. And, and, and that's what we do. And there are two different memories of this, and they're, they're probably both true. Um, Lynn, who was there in the first year, remembers that the feet fell on the floor and a child that had been following us around got so upset <laughs> that I stepped forward and picked a leaf off and gave it to them. And they had a big smile and, and, and that, but maybe, I can't remember, I've been drinking too much. <laughs> uh, also, I remember Marshall, who was one of the Mad Jack's men at the time, <coughs> bending over at the end, picking up a flower, picking up the crown and saying, does anybody want a flower? And it doesn't really matter what's happened is that from either of those stories, which both of which are probably true, everybody wanted a flower, 
everybody wanted a leaf, and this whole idea of distributing the jack and the green. So there we have the evolution, and not the invention, but the, the beginning and evolution of the custom, which is fascinating in its own right. And we hand out the leaves, and, as, as you all know, it's become, it's become this huge thing. But it's not that old. Right. Uh, in the COVID years, um, we did a socially distant Jack in the Green in the castle. We had six bogies and a Jack and the smoke, and we, we ran around up there. And when that six bogies are finished, we went out the next lot went down. And the whole lot was zoomed out so you could all join in. And one, 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 of, one of the most hilarious things everybody had gathered at dawn on the ladies bar of the garbage, even though they weren't supposed to be. And we suddenly appeared in the gateway and went, hello! <laughs> this massive cheer for these people that shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. Right, children. That's the Bristol Jack in the green. That's Jethro who's running around making all that noise. <laughs> Jethro used to come down and join us from Bristol. And eventually he went back to Bristol and took the whole idea with him. And they do it in Bristol. But that's a child of the Hastings Jack. And there are many other children as well. I'll, 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 I've got yeah. a few videos there. Ilfra Coo phoned me up and said, can we copy it please? Jack in the Green, which is another child of Hastings Jack in the Green. And you've got to remember that Hastings Jack in the Green is the child of Deptford, so. So, yeah, I'm at the end. <laughs> <laughs>